Hello to you listening to this. Welcome to or welcome back to the Liability Podcast where I, Bree Cheyenne, mostly talk about unsolved crimes against children, anything from older to newer. If this is the first episode you're finding me through, I hope you enjoy and stay for more content. If you do enjoy this episode, you can look to the description box where you'll find links to my other social medias where I post about content just like this. One other thing I wanted to mention before we jump into this episode that I didn't mention in my last few podcast episodes because I wasn't entirely sure how I wanted to do this charity thing. Also in the description box, you'll find a link to make any donations that would go towards supporting this podcast and me and any related charitable causes, such as in this case, a portion of it would be going towards a sports complex that I'm going to speak about in this episode that was built to honor the types of activities that the victims of this episode like to do. By the way, if you would prefer to donate to that directly, that link is also going to be in the description box. Now, the thing I wasn't sure about how I wanted to do is like if I wanted to pick a like specific charity that I donate to every single month or like stick with one for an extended period of time or like donate to a few different ones every month and ultimately I decided to go with that last one so it would be 10% altogether. That 10% this month would be split between the sports complex I was just speaking about as well as the DNA Doe project. I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about that but again if you would prefer to donate to them directly that link will also be in the description box. Every things in the description box. <laughs> the DNA Doe Project is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2017 that uses genetic genealogy to help identify John and Jane Doe's. Usually these are typically victims of murder cases. The reason I chose them this month is because not only is it related to a lot of what I speak about, but also it goes right in line with the next podcast I'm going to upload in which there are a lot of unidentified victims. That's all I had to say on that, and without further ado, let's get started. Two athletic and creative best friends were excited to start their journey into high school and by each other's sides. What should have been a day where they enjoyed one of their favorite pastimes, being outdoors, ended in their lives unfortunately being cut short. Now police have been hush-hush about a lot of important details of the case, presumably to protect its integrity, which has yet to result in any arrests in the five years since these murders occurred. These are the stories of Abigail Williams and Liberty German. Liberty Rose German was the older of the two, being born on December 27, 2002 in Lafayette, Indiana, to her father Derek German and her mother Carrie German Timmons. Abigail Abby Williams was born on June 23, 2003 in St. Sue Marie, Michigan to her mother Anna Williams. Both of the girls were 8th graders at Delphi Community Middle School in Delphi, Indiana. They were both described as very well-rounded and active girls with both of them participating in numerous extracurricular activities. Abby was into things like volleyball, camping, playing the sax, reading, and crafts. At the time of her death, I thought this was just the cutest little thing. She was recently knitting little hats for newborns at a hospital. Her mom described her as someone who loved making things for people. Libby also participated in multiple sports including volleyball, softball, soccer, and swimming. And she also was a big fan of science. She had hopes of becoming a science teacher one day and even was taking classes at nearby Purdue University. She was described as someone that made it a point to make people feel good. Much like Abby, she also enjoyed making crafty gifts for people. On February 13th, 2017, after asking Libby's grandmother for permission, Abby and Libby were dropped off by Libby's older sister, Kelsey, at County Road 300 North at 1.35 p.m. They had planned to go hiking in a remote area known as Deer Creek, a well-known hangout spot for local teens. The two had stayed the night together at Libby's grandparents' house because they had this February day off school, which turned out to be unusually warm. Kelsey said before she drove away, she did not notice anything unusual. It's known that the girls were still alive by 2.07 p.m. because Libby had posted two Snapchats to her story. However, after failing to meet Libby's father, Derek, when he came to pick them up, he began searching for them because it was unlike Libby to ignore people's texts and calls and like go ghost. While he was searching for them, he stopped a man in a flannel shirt asking them if he had seen the girls, to which the man replies no. After being unable to find them for that period of time, he then alerts their family who begins to help him search. 
The girls were reported missing around 5.30 p.m., which resulted in the area being searched until midnight officially, although people uh, that were volunteers, family members, things like that, continued to unofficially search for them after midnight. They also tried calling the girls' phones, of course, no answer, which they believe by this time to be either turned off or dead. Family members of the girls posted on social media asking for any help locating them. A search continued into the next day where the bodies of both girls were found around noon. There was a joint press conference held a couple hours later by Indiana State Police's Kim Riley, Carroll County Sheriff Toby Leesenby, and Delphi Police Chief Steve Mullins who announced the discovery of the bodies. However, at this time, they did not give confirmation as to whether or not it was Libby and Abby. They held a second press conference the next day to confirm that the bodies were in fact that of Abby and Libby. The details of the cause of death still has yet to be revealed to the public though. Also unknown is the identity of a man in a photograph that was released by authorities who requested assistance with identification so they could speak with him. He is one of the main suspects because he was believed to be walking on the Delphi Historic Trail at the same time as Abby and Libby. In this photograph, he can be seen wearing denim jeans, a blue jacket, a brown hat, and from what I can see, maybe black shoes and a brown shirt. Police also asked for the public's help with identifying a car that was parked at an abandoned CPS building near the crime scene on February 13th, 2017, between 12 and 5 p.m. Just days into the investigation, police had received hundreds of tips. However, nothing concrete. In the meantime, both Abby and Libby's families were engulfed in support from the community, with multiple businesses even going as far as raising funds for them. There was a visitation held for family and friends at Delphi High School before the girls were laid to rest on February 19th, 2017. Hundreds of people turned up for support at Libby's funeral while Abby's family decided to have a private service. Police came forward a few days after releasing that picture saying this man was now their prime suspect. They also released an audio of a suspect which may or may not be the same as the earlier one. In this audio, they can be heard saying, down the hill. Police were hoping in releasing this audio that the voice would be recognized by someone. I'm going to insert that clip here. It's a really short clip. The FBI had to step in and assist with the plethora of tips that the Indiana State Police were getting and they also assisted by putting up thousands of billboards across the United States to garner any information. The community continued to show support to the families by putting up orange lights in honor of the girls. Only a couple weeks after the murder, the reward fund jumped up to $200,000 after one businessman made a $97,000 donation. Three months, 16,000 tips, and 500 interviews later, and police were still not any closer to finding the person responsible. Four months after the murders, police released a composite sketch of a suspect which was allegedly based on an eyewitness uh, that was on the Delphi Historic Trail. They released an updated sketch two years later in April of 2019 and they clarified the sketches were not of the same people but that they believe the second sketch more accurately represents the man that was captured in that picture. A profile of this man described him as someone that was likely familiar with the Delphi area, either living or working there having a youthful appearance between mid-twenties to thirties, between five feet six inches and five feet ten inches tall, weighing, weighing between 180 to 220 pounds, and having reddish brown hair. At this time, they also released a short video of the blue jacketed suspect that I spoke about earlier, showing him walking, as well as more of the audio recording, which guys can now be heard at the beginning. In August of 2017, both of the families announced their construction plans for the LNA Park Foundation, which was a sports complex that has been built in memory of Abby and Libby. As I mentioned in the intro of this podcast, if you would like to donate to that foundation, a link to that will be in the description. At the end of September 2017, police traveled to Colorado to interview Daniel Nations, who was not only a convicted sex offender, but was also a suspect in the Delphi murders up until 2018. 
Nation's vehicle and description matched that of a man that was reported to be threatening hikers on their trail with a hatchet. When police found his car, they discovered a hatchet as well as a rifle and expired Indiana police. Again, they traveled to Colorado to meet him, and of course, Indiana is where these murders occurred. Police wouldn't disclose much about the similarities that existed between these cases, but they did eventually clear Nations as a suspect in February of 2018. During the course of their investigation, police uncovered a social media account, Anthony Schatz, who communicated with Libby on the day of her murder. This turned out to be the account of 27-year-old Keegan Anthony Klein, who used this catfish profile to groom underage girls. Klein was initially brought in a couple weeks after the murder for unrelated charges involving contact with underage girls. Now I'm going to be a little bit honest, I was trying to make sense of this, but the timeline did get a little bit confusing to me because it was it would appear he wasn't arrested until August of 2020. Now remember, I said he was brought in a couple weeks after the murders, and the murders occurred in 2017. So I, I don't know, maybe they just didn't have enough evidence until then, if I'm understanding that correctly. During one of his interrogations though, he was allegedly asked about previously failing a lie detector test that was related to the murders. Now another thing that was a little bit confusing to me though was apparently, uh, based on the articles, like the dates, I was looking at it looks like the police didn't come forward until a year later after this arrest they came forward in December of 2021 asking for more information about this lead Kelsey if you'll recall is Libby's sister the one that dropped them off described her anger and Libby not telling her about her communication with this man saying I was so mad I went to her grave and yelled at her I screamed I was so angry and I still am I'm frustrated Klein denied meeting up with and murdering Abby and Libby, but he has confessed to other crimes, which the legal ramifications for those are still playing out in the next few months. Now that's really the closest a suspect has had some link to the girls. Others were mostly based on like possibility due to them committing similar crimes, but they ended up being cleared and thus this case remains opened. So we have reached the end of today's case and I share it with the intention of it hopefully reaching the right person that can help get it closed. And if you are that person, please contact the Indiana State Police with the information in my description box. Thank you so much if you stuck with me until the end. I truly hope you enjoyed. If you would like to support me in this podcast, you can find the link for any donations in the description. And again, a portion of that will be going towards the LNA Park Foundation. If you haven't seen my latest YouTube upload, which was on the Oakland County Child Killer, you can also check that out with the link in the description. Honestly, just everything's in the description because I don't like to make, I don't like to talk too much during the intros and outros. So really, I try to get most of the stuff in the description box. But again, that's all I have for you guys. Bye.